Thank you, Daniel, for this very kind introduction. Thank you all for being here. I cannot really tell you how much it means to me to be able to stand now in front of you. TQC has always been my favorite conference, and I have had severe health issues this spring. I don't know if you know, but I kind of like destroyed my knee and it took two surgeries. And so standing here means two things for me because it's really pretty recent that I'm able to stand and walk. And this actually put me a bit into a pickle when it comes to the content of today's talk. Like Daniel kind of like raised the bar high and TQC ranks very highly for me. But unfortunately, I was busy with other things over the last couple of months, and I don't have a new result that I consider worthy of your time right now. And so I was freaking out for a while, but then I realized I maybe try to do something completely different today. And instead of talking about work by myself, I want to use my time as the first speaker of the entire conference to highlight talks by you that address the topic of classical shadows and maybe put them into context and share with you on a high level why I'm really excited about these talks and I'm definitely going to attend them. So please bear with me. Today, I'm not really going to talk about my own work. Here is a concrete outline. In order to get us started, I will do some high level explanation of what the overall ideas are that Robert Huang, John Preskill, myself, and in parallel, uh, Marco Paini and Amir Kalev came up with when we first envisioned classical shadows. And I will always also nastily pinpoint details where our approach is not optimal and not so good in order to later explain to you how some of you overcame these issues and really pushed the entire field forward. Okay? So this is my plan for today. And as usual, and if it is, uh, this is okay with the organizers and the chair, I'm happy to take questions throughout the talk already. Is this something we can do, Lydia? Very good. And, hmm? hmm? No, good. Okay, thanks. So, awesome. Um, so we can do that. I'm very excited. Let's jump into the actual topics. And I really want to give a very high level introduction now. There will be no technical details whatsoever. And the motivation that kind of like started this entire classical shadow state estimation procedure is really the amazing unprecedented advances we had in quantum hardware over the last five to six years. When I started my PhD, people were proud if they had devices with five or six qubits. Today, if we really try hard, we can find experimental devices with more than 100 qubits. And this is like kind of like a really amazing increase in quantum system size that we can control, compute with, and maybe access. But this increase in quantum hardware has led to a new bottleneck that kind of was always there but it was not very pronounced in this old small system. And this is the readout problem. A quantum architecture or a quantum computer doesn't provide the result it obtains in a human or machine readable form. Instead, it encodes it within correlations between individual qubits. And we have to measure those qubits to access this information, but measurement is destructive, and so we destroy the system. And we have to rerun the entire computation to get new data. And if you take this bottleneck seriously, and you have high standards, then the situation looks really grim. Because we have rigorous information theoretical lower bounds that tell us if we really want to extract the complete information out of a quantum system, a process called quantum state tomography, then the number of repetitions, number of shots we need, scales exponentially in the number of qubits. And this was not a problem when I was little and we had six qubits. Two to the six is not scary. It's super scary today. Two to the hundred is an overhead we simply cannot hope to afford. So kind of this called for new ideas. And one of the most powerful was by, uh, by Scott Aronson 
But before moving there, I want to do like my first talk advertisement and uh, put your attention on our deals talk on Wednesday, where he will show fundamental lower bounds for process tomography instead of state tomography. Okay, so I'm going to be there. I'm very excited about that. Lower bounds are hard. And he told us that process tomography is also difficult. But now back to state tomography and kind of like the problem of extracting information out of a quantum device. And there I think really a seminal insight was due to Scott, who realized that maybe demanding a full classical description of your quantum system in the sense of a full density matrix is excessive. Usually we only care about features or properties of that density matrix. So let's just estimate those directly and bypass the need to construct an exponentially large matrix. And if you take this proposal as a way forward, there are really two big uh, developments over the last couple of years. The first one is arguably much more impressive, but also conceptual. It's going under the name of shadow tomography or estimation, again pioneered by Scott. And they came up with fully quantum algorithms where you can estimate L observables, L properties, by only needing a polynomial number in N, the log of the number of properties you care about, and the accuracy many samples. So this overcomes the curse of dimensionality. It's polynomial in N, not exponential in N. And what is also important, the number of different features you want to estimate enters polylogarithmically. So this is also an exponential improvement. This is really, really surprising. The downside is that it is really a far-term quantum procedure. In order to make this happen, you have to store all your copies of the state in parallel on a huge quantum memory and address it coherently with exponentially long circuits. So this is kind of like really not near term. These are ideas we can take inspiration of, but we cannot hope to implement them in practice so far. And this is where the other avenue comes in. And this is the topic of today's talk. This is the so-called classical shadow picture. You can view it as a pure, poor man's version of Aronson's shadow tomography protocol. where we try to do near term friendly approaches that have similar features than shadow estimation but might be weaker in detail, but we can run them today. Okay, so let me quickly tell you what the main idea of these classical shadows is. Most of you will probably know already, but the idea is to kind of like break with tradition. Traditionally, if you were interested in a feature or a property of a quantum system, you would typically write it down as an observable of the underlying density matrix then you would diagonalize this observable. This gives you a specific unitary that you would apply to the state or the edge end of it, and then you would do a diagonal basis measurement, and then you would do that many, many times to get the average observable value. If you do this, this approach is fundamentally special purpose. You first look at your observable to get the unitary to run your protocol, and it's sequential. If you're interested in two different observables and they don't commute, you first have to do the first and then you have to do the second. These are just fundamental feature of standard observable predictions. And the classical shadow paradigm breaks with this tradition. And what Robert, John and myself did is we proposed to replace this specific rotation with a randomly selected one. In the easiest case, a random unitary selected from all possible unitaries according from the harm measure. And why is this not a completely crazy idea? Well, if we look about the average measurement we perform that way, we average over all possible unitary rotations, which means that on average, we measure in every possible basis. And again, on average, we learn something about the complete quantum system, all of diagonal entries. And you can make this precise. And if you know and appreciate this, then this opens the door for Monte Carlo estimation. You kind of like sample a random unitary, perform a projective measurement, which is also random, and get an outcome that, if you post-process it correctly, tells you something about the true system in average. And now you do that over and over again, and use these classical sketches to predict many observables in parallel and in an online fashion. This is the main idea. 
and a pictorial illustration for one realization for local shadows is here. You have like a big correlated system on the left, which is very, very complicated, but you just approximate it as a probabilistic average of very simple uncorrelated objects. And then you can use this empirical averaging to predict many different observables and even nonlinear features as the purity. And this by itself and by construction is universal. You can do Monte Carlo estimation for every property you can think about, and it's parallelizable. You can run Monte Carlo estimations for all the properties you care about in parallel, wait for a new shot, and update each of these estimates. And if you do that in the lab, it actually works surprisingly well. So this is now actual data we did together with Innsbruck on a trapped ion computer by playing around with an 8-qubit GHC state. 8-qubit is not huge, but it's kind of big already. And you can see that the dots, you should look at the blue dots, they converge really, really quickly. And this is really kind of like we take these random measurements in the lab and we update each of these estimations in parallel and then keep going. And you can see on the left, the blue estimation line for the purity converges pretty quickly. And you see when it converges. And the red line for the fidelity also converges pretty quickly. This line is red because kind of like red and blue have the same effect here. And you see when it converges. And the subsystem Rennie entropies, which are kind of entropies of uh, reduced density matrices of size two, also converge very quickly. So this works in practice, and it really speeds up data processing in actual quantum experiments. Like the purity in particular converged here in 16 minutes. A traditional full state tomography protocol in Innsbruck for an eight-qubit GHC state would take them more than a week. Okay? And so for the practici practitioners among you, this is maybe a good sign that this can work and this can really save resources. But this is TQC, and so there's a theory inside. There's a theory in the name. You can also prove stuff about this. And here's kind of like a very high level idea of how you would prove this. And the idea is again, you start with a density matrix, you apply a randomly selected unitary UT, you measure the individual qubits, you get a bit string ST, an outcome string, and then you kind of combine, save the unitary and the outcome string you had. And the first realization, step zero, is to choose this U randomly. This is this Monte Carlo intuition. This is what the randomized measurement toolbox suggests. The first step is to cook up a map that takes the unitary and the bit string you measured and produces a pseudo density matrix. This is the object you will take in place of the true state row. And if you want to do that properly, usually what we used is some underlying group structure in the unitaries we select. Because group structure helps you to compute integrals, which is what you need to get this map. This is not the, the last step. The second step is, sorry, to realize that if you average now these individual shots, it will converge to the property of the true quantum state. And the second step I alluded to earlier already tells you how to do that, how to prove that a simple Monte Carlo average really converges quickly to the actual target, like we saw on the plot on the last slide. And here, we just control the rate of convergence by using an IID assumption on the individual estimator sigma hat. They are really like independent IID random matrices, and if we average, they converge quickly. And back then, Robert, John, and myself looked at two concrete examples. I want to be very quick here. We looked at a global high random unitary or a global Clifford unitary as a group with an IID structure, and the theory works out nicely. And we also looked at independent single qubit rotations. We rotated each qubit. It's also a group. We have IID samples. The story works out nicely. But these are really two very special cases. And we really use the group structure and the ID assumption to get a nice story. And this is actually where I want to stop with the broad overview of classical shadow state of the art as it is. I refer you to my QRP tutorial where we do some of the technical details. And instead, I really want to use my stage time now to emphasize TQC 2023 contributions by you, how you overcome this basic primitive, in particular, away from group structures and away from the ID assumptions. 
This is a good time to stop and pause other questions or maybe comments at this point. No, very good. <laughs> very good. This was really very, very high level, just to get all of us started in a week. And the first step I want to take is to go beyond group ensembles, like sacrificing the group structure that made it possible for us to compute how these approximations should look like. And I want to motivate why this is exciting and important. So kind of like if we look at the two extreme cases that John, Robert, and myself managed to analyze, we have, I already alluded to it, on the very right, this is like a very big global unitary. As Gramring unitary, think about a global Clifford or a global high random unitary. And such unitaries, we use, we sample one of them independently and use it before we perform the measurement. This is one classical shadow framework. And these big unitaries form a group. Because if I multiply two of them, I again get a, group, uh, get a unitary, right? And then you can use Ha integration if you, take, if you sample these, group, uh, these unitaries from the Ha measure in order to compute expectation values which allowed us to get a closed form expression for these actual Monte Carlo approximations. And we could do the same on the other extreme where we had tensor products of single qubit unitaries because this is also a group. If I multiply two of them, I will again get a tensor product of single qubit unitaries. I can endow each of the single qubit unitaries with a Haar measure, perform an integral, and use the tensor product structure in order to get a concrete Monte Carlo approximation. And when you do the full analysis, you will see that kind of like these local measurements are very well suited to predict local properties. And these very, very big global rotations scramble and are very well suited to bring global properties like fidelities. But as you can see, there's a whole realm of possible circuits in between, right? And we back then didn't have any idea on how to deal with them. So let's maybe look a bit further on where we could go from here. Is this kind of like a difficult family of unitaries? We now go from random single qubit unitaries to random two qubit unitaries maybe as a first step to go to a brick wall circuit. Is this scary? Well, I would say no. This is just kind of, again, a group, because if I multiply two of these, I will again get kind of like a tensor product of two qubit unitaries. And so it's kind of like just the first story on twice as many qubits. So this is still possible. But this, not so much. Right? This is kind of like the first step towards a brick wall circuit. And if I were to multiply two of those, I would get a brick wall circuit of size four. And that's no part of it anymore. And so all these nice group averaging strategies that we used on the very left and on the very right don't directly apply to this very simple setting. But maybe this setting is somewhere between the extreme cases of local property prediction and global property prediction. And now from here, you can see how to go further, right? We could take deeper and deeper brick wall circuits until at some point we converge to these really truly random groups. But we didn't know back in 2020 how to do that because we can't use group approximation techniques. Fortunately, two of you know how to do that. And we will see these talks, I think, in the very next session in session A. Kind of like, I don't know, I think I saw Christian over there. Uh, no, Mirko over there, and is Christian here? Hi, Christian. I think you will later show us how you can go beyond these extreme cases and interpolate in the middle to get the, both, the best of both worlds. Okay? And this is why I'm excited for the next session. We can really go beyond group structure now. With that, I want to tackle the second annoying assumption we made in the first classical shadow work, which is IID samples. And there, I want to first kind of, like, kind of like tell you what we did again, and then tell you why this is maybe annoying. But if you actually want to prove that classical shadow estimation converges quickly, the best trick you can use is probabilistic tail bounds probabilistic concentration. We average random numbers. This is a bit like averaging coin tosses, and they are guaranteed to converge towards the true expectation value, which is by construction the observables we care about. And the easiest example is really, 
if all my classical shadows are generated in the same independent fashion. This is the IID case. And then I can just use Chebyshev's inequality or very basic probabilistic inequalities that show you that these things converge quickly, mainly because we have IID samples. They can't kind of like accumulate. There can't be big dependencies. And this is how you get kind of like these nice concentration results, the nice theoretical underpinning. But if you really insist on creating IID shadows, then this can be very demanding in terms of quantum hardware. Because this really forces you to sample a new random unitary every time you do a single shot measurement. This is the only way to ensure that all these snapshots are IID chosen from the same distribution. So if you do that at 10,000 times in the lab, we sample one random unitary, measure the system once, get one string of data, and then we have to sample a new random unitary, compile it on the quantum computer to get the second shot, and so on, and so on, and so on. If you talk to actual quantum hardware people, they always say this is possible, we can calibrate in real time, and you can kind of like compile a new random unitary every time, but the truth is sometimes a bit murkier. And experimentalists really hate this aspect of classical shadows because they would like to maybe sample one random unitary and then do a thousand shots because that's easier, and then maybe sample a second random unitary, do a thousand shots again, and so on. But this violates the ID assumption. And you cannot use these simple Chebyshev inequality tricks anymore. So since the early days of classical shadows, we were debating and unsure whether you can do such thrifty protocols and get comparable performance. But we never came around to do the rigorous math because it's a beyond IID study. Fortunately, Jonas did it. Is Jonas here? Jonas and Michael? Online. Jonas is online. Hi, Jonas. And I'm really looking forward to this talk as well, which is happening later today in the same session after Mirko and Christian, I think. And they will show us whether this thrifty shadow estimation where you reuse random unitaries actually works. Now, I want to attract another core feature of classical shadows and put it into question. When we came up with classical shadows, and I mentioned that on a high level earlier, the most radical step we did is we replaced specific unitary rotations for observable measurements by completely randomly selected ones. And by doing so, we completely speed, split, split up the data acquisition part, which is completely random, and the actual observable prediction part, which only happens in the post-processing. We have like kind of like I think a nice quote for that that is due to Steve Flamir. Measure now, ask questions later. But this means that the plain shadow estimation protocols are check of all trades and master of none. If they have to work for everything, they will probably be, be non-optimal for everything specific, right? Just because we forgot what we actually set out to do in the first place. And this can be very valuable information. Maybe we know what we want to measure. Maybe it's a VQE experiment, and we want to measure terms of a local Hamiltonian that tells us something about quantum chemistry. In this case, we should maybe not ignore what the actual target observables are, but take them into account. And up to very recently, there were two ways of doing that. The first one predates classical shadows, and it's called kind of like grouping. If you have poly matrices, you can try to group the terms of your Hamiltonians into subsets that all commute, because then you can jointly measure them, and then you just go through all these kind of like commuting sets. And the alternative suggestion is to start with a shadow mindset, but maybe bias the probability distribution to not use certain random unitaries that get you away from what you care about, or to de-randomize. And these two things were pretty far away. They were kind of like pretty orthogonal approaches on how to really take into account prior knowledge about observables. And Alexander and Martin, Alexander is here, will show us on Thursday how to unify these two approaches and get the best of both worlds. Another thing I'm quite excited about. Now, very quickly, classical shadows ha have actually been described in a grant evaluation I recently got as poor man's state tomography. 
And this is kind of more appropriate, although it hurts, hurts than it maybe I would like it to be. We really try to estimate approximations of a state with fewer resources and fewer tricks than standard state tomography. But this means that classical shadows are much, much cheaper and less demanding than full state tomography. And for general states, this means there's a price you have to pay. Classical shadows has to tell you less than full state tomography. Just because we invested far fewer resources and fewer than we should according to fundamental lower bounds. But you can ask yourself, maybe there are certain families of states where this discrepancy is not so severe and where you can use classical shadow inspiration and efficient sampling techniques to learn a complete description of the state where this is really not a trade-off. And we will see two talks addressing this question. One of them is by Daniel, and the other one is by Sabé. I don't know if he's here or if he's attending online. But they look at certain families of state. I think you look at Gibbs states, and Sabé is looking at fermionic states, where they show that he can really bridge this gap. And finally, this is the last point I want to talk about, and actually the one that is most exciting for me in my actual uh, current research, is I want to advertise the use of classical shadows as a data format. And the most, most natural comparison here is matrix product states or matrix product operators. This is one of the most successful way of representing quantum systems in our computers and reason about them. And a, classic, uh, a matrix product state is decrypted on the left. left. Just, a remember, uh, just as a reminder, they were developed to reason about quantum systems with pen and paper and or classical algorithms. Classical shadows on the right look a bit similar, but instead of having this inner dimension, you just sample, you average uncorrelated systems. But this is also kind of like efficient because each of the summons can be stored efficiently. And they were developed to really interpret quantum data. So in order to create them, you need at least a simulated quantum architecture. But once you have that, you could also take the right-hand side to store a classical representation of a quantum system, much like you could use an MPS. And there's interesting similarities and differences between the two approaches. The first of them is a matrix product state is always physical. It's always a pure state, it's a density matrix. Classical shadows are almost never physical. Kind of like if we take these local classical shadows as an example, the, second eigen, the, sec, the smallest eigenvalue can be exponentially small. So this is very far away from physical, but all you need is that kind of like washes out on average. On the other hand, if you work with MPS representations, then they are really nonlinear state representations. If I add two MPS approximations of two density matrices, I don't have an MPS anymore. We kind of like leave the space of all MPSs. And this makes analyzing MPS, at least for me, very challenging. With classical shadows, it's the opposite. It's kind of like a probabilistic linear approximation. If I take a linear combination of two classical shadows, it's a classical shadow of the linear combination of quantum states, if you extend everything properly. And this means that if you do data analysis, it's much, much easier on the right-hand side. But we sacrifice physicality for that. This is really a trade-off. And the other thing is that matrix product states, once they are work, allow you to approximate all observables you can conceive accurately, because you have an actual state representation. The downside is that it is only efficient for certain states. You need a small bond dimension and a general state has an exponentially high bond dimension. And with classical shadows, it's exactly the other way around. They work for all possible states, but not for all possible observables. So this is another trade-off, where sometimes MPS is better, sometimes classical shadows are better. Why do I say this? Because if you take classical shadows as a data format seriously, it allows you to think in entire pipelines where on the very left is an actual quantum architecture that maybe generates interesting states, interesting data, you use classical shadows as a quantum to classical conversion and then feed the classical shadow 
into a classical algorithm or even a machine learning model. And this pipeline in principle allows you to seamlessly integrate quantum architectures with classical learning algorithms and gives you a hybrid platform to reason about learning from quantum experiments. And this is something that we proposed last year together with Robert Huang, Giacomo Torley, Victor Albert and John Preskill that you can use such pipelines to actually efficiently learn properties of ground states or phases of matter. And we worked very hard and we got polynomial guarantees. And a really cool recent paper, again by Daniel, kind of like showcases that our bounds were kind of like exponentially worse than his. Kind of like he, in his talk, is again going to explain you how you can improve the rigorous guarantees for these types of pipelines by a lot. And with that, I'm actually already ready to conclude. And my conclusion is very high level. I want to remind you that classical shadows or the randomized measurement toolbox in general is an alternative way of how to approach quantum data analysis and more generally learning with quantum experiments. And the big idea is to not measure what you think you want to measure, but measure something randomly and then predict the actual things you or your supervisor care about just in the classical post-processing. This comes with surprisingly many advantages. And this idea started off kind of small in 2019, 2020, by a work by Marco Paini and Amir Kalev, as well as another related work by Tom Preskill, Robert Huang, and myself. But now I'm really happy to see that it's grown into a true community effort. Kind of like a lot of you are adding your unique experience and expertise to make this idea much, much better. And a lot of the serious drawbacks that we had in the early algorithms were overcome by us as a community. And just exemplary for this is this schedule for TQC 2023. This is again a reminder for all shadow related talks that close a lot of the gaps I've raised here in this conference. And I think this is really amazing and I want to thank all of you who did that because many of these works are so technically strong that I could never have come up with them. And I'm really happy to see how this idea is growing and becoming more mature. And if you permit me, the last slide is kind of like a personal advertisement. As Daniel said, I'm a professor in Linz. And after many years of trying and planning and kind of like strategizing, I'm finally ready to leave stealth mode. So kind of like we are now kind of like have a small, nice group in Linz. And I invite each and every one of you to maybe drop by. Linz is probably a city you've never heard about, but it's very easy to find it on a map if you know either where Munich, Vienna, or Prague is, because it's exactly in the middle. And I guess that many of you have already traveled from Munich to Vienna because these are quantum hubs, and Linz until now has not been a flyover state, but a drive through by train city. And I invite you to maybe leave the train and visit us there. And for those younger people among you, I was kind of like also very busy writing grants, and one of them lucked out. And so we actually have funding, and we're hiring right now. So here is a picture of our core group, but we want to expand further. So if you're interested in these ideas, then please come and talk to me. We still have a couple of open positions. Thank you very much. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Richard, for this very nice talk and overview of the field. Indeed, just the fact that we have a whole session now dedicated to this framework just uh, clearly shows how important it became. Uh, so, yeah, I guess we have plenty of time for questions. Maybe Nicole can start. Thanks for the really excellent overview. I appreciated hearing about the holes that, as you said, have been filled in large part by talks at this conference. What are 
open questions, uh, open holes that have not been filled? Excellent question. Like the big issue is that scaling issues still remain from in, for many interesting properties that we care about. Kind of like before, I told you there's fundamental lower bounds that tell us that you need exponentially many samples in order to get to do full state tomography. And classical shadows tells you that you can predict some observables much more efficiently. And this kind of like this region of the observables we can predict much more efficiently has been sufficiently ex very much expanded, but it's arguably still not there where we want it to be. Like kind of like in particular when it comes to quadratic properties, kind of like the standard frameworks we have are not efficient yet. I think they push what we can do to maybe the sizes of quantum architectures we have today, but I don't know if they hold up if we have 100,000 qubits also. Thank you. Okay, next question. Maybe over there. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the nice overview. Uh, so I just had a, a conceptual question where you were comparing like matrix product states and uh, classical shadows. So there was this comment that uh, you insist on physicality on the matrix product state side, but things can have negative eigenvalues on the, I assume that's, that's what you meant uh, by unphysical, that you can have negative eigenvalues for, for the reconstruction. Is, is that correct? Sorry, I had a bit of trouble understanding you. Uh, Are you asking about the negative eigenvalues? Yeah, yeah. So by unphysical, you just meant that there, there can be some negative eigenvalues, right? Yes. Okay, so, and, and this is the cost you pay for the linearity of the representation, right? Like, the, the, it happens because the representation is linear in some sense. So I was just wondering if this is kind of conceptually related to the fact that you can have quasi-probability representations of quantum theory which have, uh, you know, which have some negativity. Ah, sorry, am I too fast? Uh, okay, so I was wondering if this is related to uh, quasi-probability representations, like the fact that you can represent quantum theory in a linear way if you, like in a classically, when you allow for negative, uh, rep, like phase-space representations that yes. have some negativity. So is um, this related to that? Or? I think so. Here's a statement that I know about because I've worked in the past on frame theory. Kind of like, if you want to get something physical, in a representation on the right-hand side, you would have to be able to rewrite your object as a sum of non-negative objects, like right as a sum of, se uh, of density matrices. And for quantum, this would kind of be the definition of separable states, right? Mm -hmm. So kind of in that way, it's, yeah, I think, conceptually related. But we know that most interesting states are not separable states. So they lie outside the realm where you can approximate it physically in the strong sense that each of these objects is a physical object. Mm -hmm. And so we simply ignore that and realize that it converges very quickly. And as soon as you look at single dimensional observables, you will not see the negative eigenvalues. Mm -hmm. Did this answer your question? Yes, I mean, yeah, it was just like, just an intuition I had and I think, I think yes. you have the same intuition, so thank you. More questions? Ah. Okay, let me see if I... Hello, thank you for, for the talk. I wanted to ask about something you mentioned right at the beginning when you said that uh, you had to establish this map between sort of the observables that you picked and what you measured and, um, and then relate this with this sort of pseudo state that you took the average over. So in, in your illustrations, you mentioned that you take sort of a learning approach, right? So um, can you maybe also put down your mask quickly? Okay, Thanks. is this better? Yeah, and so I was saying that um, from your figures and from, from what I remember, you have sort of a learning approach, right, where you uh, learn this map in practice. But for working with pen and paper, this may be a problem or not. So what, what do, you, do you have any techniques? So if you wanted to do this on paper, you want to work with the sketch on paper, um, what could you do to sort of establish this map between your shadows and then this um, random, or this, uh, sorry, pseudo state? Uh, well, I think you're right. Like one of them is just to learn it to like try to solve a regression and have enough data to do it. The other way on pen and paper, how we did it, really used the group structure. Huh. Because if you have a group structure, you can the expectation value becomes an integral over all possible unitaries, just kind of an average over your group. And then you can use group and representation theory to get nice analytical expressions. And this is really the only way how I knew how to address these problems, which is why I'm very excited about the upcoming talks 
where they really showed how to do something similar without the group structure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Um, maybe this, okay, this question may be all formed, but let me just. Um, you mentioned about uh, observable specific protocols for classical shadows, right? You talked about, say, you're doing VQE, you have a Hamiltonian, and you want to sort of tailor your classical shadow routine to those observables. Is that, is that a serious proposal in VQE? Like, wouldn't, is it right to say that you would rather use a classical shadow routine to measure energy in VQE? Or, like, it seems to me that if you know what observables, my intuition has always been that you use classical shadows in a setting where you don't know what you're actually going to want to measure. But in this case, you know what you want to measure. Is it right to say that you actually do want to, you, you're claiming you do want to use a classical shadow routine for this? But maybe two answers, like maybe a half answer from myself is when we came up with these older methods, we were really inspired by an experiment that Innsbruck did on the lattice Schwinger model, where they didn't just want to find the lowest energy eigenstate, but a low energy eigenstate. Mm -hmm. And so they minimized the variance of the Hamiltonian not the Hamiltonian themselves. I see. And they're kind of like, because you square the Hamiltonian, they really didn't have like a nice way of grouping anymore. And there the classical shadows were really competitive back then. I see. So these situations appear. And for the more general question, I would actually defer this to Martin and Alexander <laughs> who are just sitting in front of you. Okay. <laughs> Maybe they can answer. I don't know. Okay. Uh, so next question. Maybe we still have 10 minutes or so. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, I was wondering what, uh, what other random unitaries you can use, because Clifford and local Clifford, I mean, you need, you need to be able to invert to obtain the, the shadow, right, from the outcome of the measurements. I think I heard, I, I saw somewhere match gates, shadows. You need to do that efficiently. Are there other sets of unitaries that are natural for you to do that? Well, that's a very good question, and I saw with match gates and Cliffords are like the only ones that were very high up on my mind. But this doesn't mean that there isn't others, and people use, for example, tensor networks, actually, because if you have short depth circuits, then this should all work efficiently. But other than match gates and Cliffords, and you're right, this is very important, that we can classically efficiently simulate them, because that means we can also classically efficiently store them. And yeah, I think, big question to all of you, can you think of other interesting groups of unitaries that we maybe can store even for hundreds or thousands of qubits. I think this is an open question. Thanks. Next question. Uh, Alvaro, behind ah, you. Alvaro. Yeah, Alvaro. Uh, thanks. Um, so you had this slide bef uh, later on uh, comparing with, uh, with MPS. I found very interesting. So I, I would like to know how far you can push this analogy, because uh, for MPS, we have some good idea, I think, of where, which states you can represent, for instance, given the area law of entanglement and so on. And here you say you look at some observables, right? So do you have some like physical property of the observables? Yes, for example, or? for example, all local observables. Right. So like local, local observables will be the equivalent of the area law, let's say, in this case. Yes. Okay. But if you do like global Cliffords, then you would have all low Hilbert Schmidt norm observables. Right, it depends a bit on the data format of classical shadows. Okay. So there's no, but there's no fundamental physical feature that yes. no, oh, there is. Okay. No, I think there's not because you scramble, right? This right. is more like information theoretical. Right. Did this answer your question a bit? Uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. Thanks. Okay, maybe one last question from the other side so that they're not so biased. Uh, well, I think no questions from the other side. Oh, but one over there. Hello. Uh, since you mentioned the idea is to implement this in the near term, uh, could you could you expand on your ideas of how to deal with mice? On how to do what? How to deal with mice ah, in the classical shadow. Excellent question. This was also a community effort last year. This is why I didn't decide to talk about it this year. But one nice feature of the randomized measurement toolbox which, we, which I wasn't aware in the beginning, but it turned out to be very fruitful, is that we do random unitary evolutions here. And in the most extreme case, these random unitaries are tensor products of single qubit unitaries. So what this does is it averages out noise, like in randomized benchmarking, like in randomized compiling. 
So just by the fact, by the mere observation that you do a randomized measurement protocol, you basically do randomized compiling, which reduces the noise channels to often depolarizing channels that you can learn efficiently. And if you know what they are, you can undo them in the Monte Carlo stage. So, Monte Ca so error mitigation is actually ingrained into these approaches. And Steve Flamia, for instance, and his group worked it out explicitly. So this actually works very well in practice. Okay, so let's thank Richard again for this amazing talk.